Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome to this keynote address and book signing with Professor Lawrence Gostin uh, on the publication of his book Global Health Law with Harvard University Press. My name is Graham Laurie, I'm the director of the Mason, St Mason Institute in the School of Law here in the University and we are proud to jointly host this event with the Global Academies of Justice and Health in the University. The format for this evening is that Professor Gostin will speak for around 30 minutes, um, immediately followed by brief responses from our panel of experts, whom I will introduce in due course. Uh, we will then open the discussion to the floor and we aim to finish by uh, 5.15, because there's an opportunity for book signing with Professor Gostin. The event is being recorded and roving mics will be used, and we trust that there's no objection to this. Without further ado, let me introduce our keynote speaker. Professor Lawrence Gostin is the founding O'Neill Chair in Global Health Law in Georgetown University in Washington DC and he is also Professor of Public Health at John Hopkins University. For many years Professor Gostin was the Director of Liberty here in the UK and he currently, is currently the Director of the World Health Organization Collaborating Centre on Public Health Law and Human Rights. His talk tonight could hardly be more timely and I think there's hardly anybody globally who is better placed to deliver it. The, t the title of that talk is Imagining Global Health with Justice, Ebola and Impoverished Peoples and Health Systems and I would invite Larry to come and deliver his keynote. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much and thank you all for uh, attending this evening. I appreciate it very much and I did want to express my appreciation to uh, the University of Edinburgh and to Graham Laurie in particular, Christine Bell um, and Harriet Cornell who have been uh, among many uh, just wonderful gracious hosts and uh, it's very wonderful for me. My, my wife's uh, a southerner from Keswick in the Lake District. Um, uh, of course, in the UK, it's th in, in England, she's thought of as a northerner. Um, but uh, so I come here very often, and and, and I um, I adore it. So thank you very much for having me, uh, and to my wonderful responders uh, as well. Uh, as Graham knows uh, from today, I've been uh, there's a quarantine uh, uh, going on in the United States about Ebola and I've just been absolutely flooded and inundated uh, and I just wish I could have the magic of being in two places at once but uh, not able to quite accomplish that. Um, I, I, w I was tempted to just throw, a ma throw away my talk and talk about Ebola as we did at the lovely lunch that we had um, with faculty today but I think I'll stick to the script uh, I'll talk a little bit about the book and then I'll um, uh, discuss uh, how it might apply in the case of Ebola, uh, if, if I may. Uh, one of the things I've noticed uh, in the last um, uh, uh, little while uh, is, is that you have two very distinct global health narratives in the world. One of them is given by uh, all of the great and the good in, in global health. Uh, Margaret Chan, the head of WHO, um, Bill Gates, Michael Bloomberg. In fact, uh, many of these people have been on charm offenses in the United States saying what absolutely, uh, how wonderfully we're doing in global health. And their narrative is actually quite true. We are doing very well in global health. Uh, if you look at uh, many of the uh, um, indicators from the Millennium Development Goals, for example, we're doing exceptionally well. Um, uh, child maternal health uh, is, uh, has never been better. Longevity has never been better, including in the uh, developing world. Uh, more people than ever dreamt of before are on antiretroviral medications for uh, HIV AIDS. Uh, child and infant survival is up. So all of the indicators are very, very good. And we've made enormous progress as we approach uh, the post-2015 agenda where uh, Ban Ki-moon and the um, uh, UN uh, itself uh, is uh, now uh, considering the post-Millennium Development Goal agenda, which is now going to be called the Sustainable Development Goals. But I've also um, do a lot of work with civil society around the world and particularly in uh, low and middle income countries 
uh, and I hear from them a completely different narrative, a narrative of great suffering and hardship. Um, and both narratives, it turns out, are really true. But I, we sometimes forget the narrative of, uh, of the poor. And so one of the things uh, that Harvard University Press did me a wonderful favor about is, is that I said, well, I could get a, a forward uh, to the book from uh, the head of the World Health Organization or Michael Bloomberg or Bill Gates or anybody who you like. Um, Bill Clinton or Hillary said she would. Um, and they said, no, nobody cares what they think. Um, come up with something new. And so I racked my brains, and what I did at the beginning of the book is the best part of the book. And it's the best part of the book because I didn't write it. Um, it was written um, by young people from around the world. Just, and I just asked them, tell me about what your daily life is like. And here are what I call global health narratives from the young. And I'm just going to give you two snippets. There are many in the book. But one uh, is from uh, Namubu. Uh, who is a young woman and who's living in Gaba, which is a suburb of Kampala, Uganda. And she writes, I live in a very rowdy place. No clean water, no good toilets, no bathrooms. I have to move a long distance every day looking for clean water to bathe, to cook. At night, the conditions worsen. There is hardly any electricity. The mosquito noise fills up the place. Cockroaches move around me, and this makes me sick. Even when I fall ill, I hardly ever go to hospital. My mother, who would have helped me with medication fees, is living with AIDS. Life is too hard and complicated for me. I have to cook food for my brother and myself. This forces me to cook one meal a day, for I lack money to access the food that I need to get healthy. And a lot of violence happens to my friends and me. We were raped and robbed. Our property was stolen. I am thinking of getting a job. However small, the salary will be too small. I am so sad. I need a new life. And one of the ideas I had with the global health narrative is to try to explain to my readers that global health is not, not, not just about people out there. It's people in our own communities. And I've been doing a lot of work with uh, American Indian communities. Uh, and uh, I hope you ask me questions about it, because the conditions that they live in are appalling, and, and, are, and, and the diseases they have are so preventable. In one place, uh, which is the Blackfoot Reservation in Montana, can you guess what the average life expectancy is of a male in that reservation? 47 years old. And just outside the reservation, it's in the mid-80s. So it just gives you an indication of <coughs> that global health is in high-income countries as well as low. And so I asked Johnny, um, a young boy living in the Blackfeet Reservation, to give me uh, a snippet of his life. And uh, I'll use my best American accent for this. I start my days with a cup of joe. Then I corral, I ride, and I break horses. I smoke a bowl of weed about six or seven times, if I have it. Otherwise, I smoke whenever it shows up. It's a stress reliever. My father uses drugs, snorting coke in front of me, taking my birthday money. He even did a line of coke with me. And he used alcohol since before I was born. My dad was abusive to all of us. He was verbally abusive. He beat us with a belt. When your family is broken due to drugs and alcohol, everyone is hurt. It makes me mad when people in the community do the heavier drugs. What I mean is, what little kids get to eat or not to eat? Did they get the shoes or the clothes they needed? It depends on whether the adults do drugs. I know it can't be stopped, but it's unfair that grown-ups get what they want and children do without. I want to shout, when you do meth, hey, don't let your kids be here. If I could, I would turn our reservation into a dry reservation and no gambling. My life is gone, but what about the kids? And what strikes me about uh, these two global health narratives 
is, is that they're both true. Um, one is true about absolute improvements in global health, and the other is true about still gapping uh, and unconscionable disparities uh, between the haves and the have-nots, both within our own societies and in low- and middle-income countries. And so that uh, led me to uh, consider what I might do in the final uh, chapter of the book. And what I did in the final chapter, and I, I was pleased that I did it because the book can, you know, the book is, is actually, um, it's actually interesting. It doesn't look like it would be on global health law, but the Times did a review, and the very first line was, you know, this book is really interesting. Um, and most people don't think of law as interesting, but it tells a story. And so, as I, I, tried, to, I tried to be a proper law professor for most of the book, and, and, and with all the nuances, but in the last chapter, what I do, and I find it's a very good way for authors to try to, uh, to, to think about a problem, is, is that I oversimplified it. And I think when you really simplify something, it, ha it can have a clarity that you just don't get when you're mired in the complexity of something. And so without apologies for the simplicity, because I had been so complex before in the book, I said, I think that if we could answer three questions, three critical questions, and we could implement the answers to those questions, we would have a wonderful state of global health. And these two narratives I talked to you about led me to think that we shouldn't talk about global health, and we shouldn't talk necessarily about global health justice. What I call it is global health with justice. That is, you want to do both. You want to get steady improvements in overall life expectancy uh, and uh, uh, improvements in disability-adjusted life years. That we want to do. We want to continue doing that. We want to encourage the Bill Gates and others to, to do that. But on the other hand, we also need justice. And sometimes you can have one without the other, but we need both, and that's why I call it global health with justice. So what are these three questions? The first question is, what would an ideal state of global health be like? That may seem such an obvious question that we would know, um, but I posit that we don't know. And in fact, what we do as an international community is we do exactly the opposite of what we ought to do. The second um, issue is uh, what would a st an ideal state of global health with justice look like? And the third question uh, is once we understand what an ideal state of global health with justice would be, how would we get there? Well, I'm going to discuss the first two tonight. Um, but you'll have to read the book to find out how to get there, because um, uh, I don't have the time. But I think the first two are important. So what would an ideal state of global health look like? Well, an ideal state of global health would look like would have three packages of attributes, three, three attributes. Um, and I think if you have these three attributes, you would have robust opportunities for a healthy and a healthy life with well-being. And what are they? One is health care. Um, essential medicines, visiting a doctor, primary care, all the kind of essential health care that you would want. Uh, the WHO calls it universal health coverage. The second thing that you would want are public health services. Now, public health services are not health care. They're not delivered by doctors and nurses. That what they are are things that make our society good. Um, I suppose many of you may know John Snow, for example, one of the pioneers of the public health approach. He wasn't a doctor. I think he was an epidemiologist or something like that. Um, but he, when there was an epidemic of cholera in London, um, he didn't treat the cholera. 
he turned off the, the Broad Street pump, and that stopped the cholera epidemic in its tracks. Um, so what is the public health approach? Um, it's uh, clean air, nutritious food, uh, it's hygiene, it's sanitation, it's disease surveillance and control, it's tobacco control, alcohol control, injury prevention, it's mosquito and other vector abatement. It's those kinds of things that are really not within the medical sector, but they are things that we expect public health agencies to do. And then the third thing that we would do is have socioeconomic determinants of health. These are actually outside the entire health sector. Uh, they're things like employment, poverty alleviation, education, um, jobs. In fact, people sometimes tell me, if, if you could wave a magic wand and do one thing for global health in the world, what would you choose? And I have no doubt what I would choose. Education for women. Uh, because women take care of their families, they take care of their communities. Well-educated women are, are living, live in healthy communities. But it has nothing to do with health sector, per se. Um, and so what I wanted to do is, and, but I should also say that, that socioeconomic determinants actually make more difference to health than anything else. Um, so, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever been on, in Washington, D.C. <coughs> Probably not, some of you may have. But there's a red line on the metro that goes from poor southeast to affluent northwest where the National Institutes of Health is in Bethesda uh, and the Walter Reed, uh, and, and the, um, uh, the, the military hospital where one of the Ebola patients was actually being kept. For every stop that you go on the red line from southeast to northwest, you gain three to four years of life expectancy. It's not because the medicine is different, it's because the socioeconomic factors are different as you go along, just to give you an idea. But it's not even just socioeconomic factors, it's also actually your relative status. It turns out that if you're nominated for an Academy of War Award, you live longer than if you don't. And if you win, you live longer than if you were just nominated. Um, all curiosities. But I'm going to take socioeconomic determinants off the table because they're not in the health sector and just simply ask the question, um, which would we prefer to live in a society with unlimited medicine or unlimited public health? And I think this is where uh, we make a, a very grave error in our uh, work because we, we do the opposite of what I think is needed. Um, we basically focus almost all of our efforts on health care, on medicine, uh, on doctors. And even there, in global health, we don't provide a national health service or a, or a horizontal health system capacity for providing health care. We do it disease by disease. We do AIDS, we do t TB, we do malaria. Um, and we literally um, uh, have this kind of siloed effect that focuses first on the wrong priority, and secondly, um, even, on, even if you could achieve a system of a, a strong health care system, you would need to do it horizontally and broadly so it would cover everything non-communicable diseases, safe childbirth, um, well baby clinics, um, uh, mental health, injury prevention, all these kinds of things. Um, but uh, we don't. And I've always had a very hard time trying to explain to people why this is so. That is why the population-based public health approach um, is better than the medical health care approach. In fact, in my family, we actually have a saying, um, well, actually two sayings. My son says that dad sucks all of the joy out of life, which is probably true because I make him eat healthy and do all kinds of good things. But the other saying is, is that dad knows public health, mom knows everything else. 
Um, so I do know public health. Um, and how do I explain it to people? So I was struggling with the last chapter of the book, and then I came back from a very typical uh, urban city in sub-Saharan Africa. And I was feeling not well. Um, I had a bad stomach. I couldn't breathe very much because of all the diesel smoke, and I was like a little bit asthmatic. I just felt very unwell. And I realized whenever I come back from a, 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 a poor city around the world, I just don't feel good. But if I come back from Edinburgh tomorrow, which I will, hey, I feel great. Come back from Oslo, even better. <laughs> come back from Melbourne, I'm in heaven. <coughs> and in none of those places did I see a doctor or get any medicine. The reason I felt good or bad depended upon what the environment was in which I lived. And that was really critically important. And so what I did is I did a, uh, in the final chapter, kind of a Rawlsian experiment. I don't know if, uh, how many of you know John Rawls, but Rawls was, uh, uh, he, he died fairly recently. He was a Harvard um, uh, philosopher, uh, jurisprudence, and he, uh, he was very, very deeply influential. In fact, for many years, probably still to this day, most philosophy departments around the world were either pro or anti Rawlsian. He's very, very, very well known. Um, but Rawls had a, an idea about a theory of justice, um, which was that if you didn't know the circumstances in which you were going to be, that is, you were on a veil of ignorance, that you would choose the just thing. And so I've done this exercise with people around the world. I've done it in Delhi and Beijing and Buenos Aires and Washington, D.C. I've done it everywhere. And audiences, no matter where they are, always answer the same way. Let's see if an Edinburgh audience does as well. So you have two stark choices. And remember, you don't know if you're young, old, um, uh, what the color of your skin is, if you're uh, ill, if you will be ill or not, healthy or a person with a disability. Uh, you don't know um, if you're a male or female. Um, in other words, you don't know if you are, you are going to be born um, in uh, Dhaka uh, in Bangladesh um, or in Edinburgh in Scotland. Um, and you were in this veil of ignorance and you were given these two choices. You could either choose whatever health care you wanted. You could get the finest medicines, the finest surgeons, the finest consultants, and anything you would want, high-end cancer treatment, anything, or you could never see a doctor again the rest of your life. But you would wake up every morning and you'd turn on the tap and there'd be clean water. Um, you'd go outside and there wouldn't be malarial infected mosquitoes or dengue infected mosquitoes or bubonic uh, carrying rats. Um, you would um, have clean air um, to breathe. The roads would be designed in a safe way so that it uh, helped um, prevent uh, injuries. Um, you wouldn't be accosted by tobacco smoke. Um, there would be sanitation and hygiene. In other words, you would have the perfect public health or population-based public health life. And if you could choose one of those two stark alternatives, the question is which one you would choose. And so you've got 15 seconds to make up your mind. Um, mm, mm, okay, time's up. <laughs> uh, so who would choose all the medicine and doctors they could get? Sometimes one or two people in the audience, and this is a big audience, I would have expected one or two. This one is just kind of putting his hand up like this. Uh, and who would want the public health approach? In other words, who wants to live in Melbourne? <laughs> we all do. The coffee's great. Lovely life. Um, and yes, everywhere in the world people choose that. Beijing, Latin America, India, Bangladesh, uh, U.S. and European cities, Germany, everywhere. 
but yet we organize our international assistance in exactly the opposite way, exactly the opposite way. And things that we would never tolerate here in Scotland or in the United States or anywhere else, um, like turning on your tap and, uh, and getting uh, uh, dysentery or going out and having malarial uh, mosquitoes infect us, um, we would never tolerate it, and yet we never think to, to build that into our global health programs. Instead, we're, we're delivering high-end expensive medicines. And so that really was the idea of global health. That's what an ideal of global health would be. It would prioritize public health, population-based services. It would provide universal health care coverage as well. And it would attend to the social determinants of life. That is what a... Uh, a, an ideal state of global health would look like and that's what we'd make.